This episode of the Kind of Funny Games Cast is brought to you by Sherry's Berries. There's no one like your Valentine. This year, treat them to an unforgettable gift that's as unique as they are. Don't tell her, but I am definitely getting Gia some of these babies. This was written for Tim. I'm not cheating on Jen. Sherry's Berries will deliver your gift fresh and on time, guaranteed, or your money back. These berries are decadent, fresh, juicy, sweet, and shareable, just like Gia Harris. Damn it, Tim. And... You can choose to get them dipped in white, milk, or dark, dark chocolatey goodness like Gia Harris. What does that mean? To With Valentine's Day right around the corner, there's only one way to get these freshly dipped strawberries from Sherry's Berries starting at $19.99. Go to berries.com. That's berries, B-E-R-R-I-E-S.com. Click on the microphone in the top right and enter in. KF Games. That's berries.com. Use the code KF Games. Help support this show and get some sweet, sweet berries for your sweet, sweet Valentine, like my sweet, sweet baby Gia Harris. God damn it, Tim. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Kind of Funny Games Cast, episode 106. It's, it's, it's funny because usually Tim would be here and Colin would be here and we would say the first time ever, the first one, and it's not this time, but I'll explain that in a second. Over here is my very special guest, Pete Hines from Hi. Bethesda. Hey, how are you? Yay for me. No, don't clap for yourself. That's clap. a bad look. That's oh, okay. a bad look. Don't worry. Um, if kids don't know, Pete Hines from Bethesda, you are VP of marketing and PR over there. Yeah. You've been there how long? Uh, a little over 17 years. 17 and change. Gotcha. Um, you've made a lot of history there. I have. Been there, been there a long time for a lot of stuff. You've made kind of funny history as well. Yeah. You are a part of the biggest kind of funny disaster we've ever had. It's an honor. It, <laughs> so what happened is yesterday you came in and did and just fucking killed it. You did. No, we did a games cast <laughs> for like an hour and 45 minutes and it was awesome. And it was me and it was Tim and it was Colin and it was you. And we just went and it was, you know, three topics that were all about you and Bethesda. And then the end of it was reader mail where they asked you questions yeah. as well. And it was awesome and thought provoking and great. And we got all these interesting things. And then we stood up, said goodbye to you, sat back down, did two ads. And then we all sat down and me and Tim started talking about what we needed to do next. And we just hear Kevin, fuck and we're like what and he, and he came in he's like there's no audio on the ads and i'm like oh we can do those again he's like i need to check the games cast and i was like oh no and he's like you check ps i love you and a, we, and a hush fell over the room and it was one of those things and i like and i've been there and like i you know i saw kevin do it and i was like and it, i you know edit ps i love you and up, uh, other shows for us and so i checked my, the ps i love you footage which was recorded literally minutes before you got here yep. it was fine and then yeah he looked at the games cast and nothing there and there's one pop and it's like it's one of those to be very clear you know we usually whenever something goes wrong we give kevin shit or whatever this was not kevin's fault nope. one of our drives just completely died for no reason nobody Happens. knows why why. And you being such a stand-up guy decided to come back today to talk to me. Here I am. And so I thought we thought rather than do the same thing, thank you very much, and be awkward and make you <laughs> do the exact same beats and everything else, we'll just do a one-on-one, -on -one, which works out in my favor. Because I feel like I, I, I first off miss interviews like well, how I used to do up at sure. noon, even though this is gonna be way longer than an up at noon. But I also like you a lot. We've we've been we've struck up the bromance on the yeah. internet. Yeah. How's that feel? Plus, plus, yesterday I accidentally announced the next three BGS titles, and that would have yeah. been really bad for me. Sure, to, like completely unscripted to have announced everything Todd Howard is working on for the next. Exactly, like, eight fall in New Orleans. It was rough, you know. We didn't know how to do. We didn't. Not, know. Okay, not funny. <laughs> <laughs> not funny. Uh, no, yeah, but honestly, it's fine. I, I, uh, yeah, I totally understand, and uh, yeah, I, I was too excited to. Have, find, have a chance to finally be on after, I mean, you and I had talked and I was like, God, I'm never in San Fran and yeah. here I am. And yeah, I finished all this stuff today. It, this is, this is great. Good yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, what are you in town for right now? You're because obviously Bethesda out in Maryland where you guys usually are. Right. We, well, we announced uh, the Elder Scrolls Online uh, Morrowind today, which is next big chapter for uh, the Elder Scrolls Online and me having worked on Morrowind, you know, uh, 15 odd years ago, yeah. came out to not only talk about this, but also give some context for like, you know, what was Morrowind? What, why did it, why did it matter? Why is it cool? Why is this a, a cool thing to, to want to play? So I've been doing a lot of stuff for that and talking about some Elder Scrolls Legends stuff and you know the deal. I just sort of shoot the shit about whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So why, how do you keep doing it? Why do you keep doing it? Like you're talking about, you know, more than 15 years of doing this for Bethesda. You know I mean? You've been yeah. in one spot doing all this stuff. Uh-huh. What keeps you coming back? Because I mean, like, it, it, I don't know how much our audience knows, but like, what you're describing, of course, sounds fun. Oh, you come out to San Francisco, you meet some people, you talk about this game, but 
year after year, you know, every five years, you have a family, you're, you're, you're leaving everyone, you know, to come out here and talk to strangers, people, acquaintances, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Do fun things, but you're working and it yep. is that thing of time differences and flights and this, that, and the other complications. What, what makes you stay at Bethesda? What makes you stay in this industry? What makes you keep wanting to work on yeah. these games? Um, I don't, I don't spend a whole lot of time ever thinking about that. It's a good question, but I, like, it's not something, it's just like, this is what I want to do. I feel like this is what I was meant to do. Yeah. Um, I was meant to be at a company like Bethesda. I always, growing up, um, I, I was a little kid. I was the smallest kid in my class all, all the way through grade school. Uh, you know, first kid in line for the class pictures when they went size, yeah, yeah. shortest <laughs> to tallest. Um, and uh, even through high school, you know, I, I didn't really hit a growth spurt until I hit college. So I, I was, uh, you know, I went to a small Catholic high school in, in North Carolina. I went to a small university, Wake Forest. And I was just kind of used to like, I don't know, smaller, more close knit environments. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, when I started at Bethesda 17 plus years ago, that, that's what Bethesda was. I mean, the team working on Morrowind at the time was in one hallway. It was probably 12 people that I, that I sat with. The company total was, you know, maybe 25 Jeez. or plus How a, big is in it Bethesda. Uh, we're probably over 1500. Jeez um, Louise. And, uh, you know, got offices all over the world and, and all of that, but it's, um, you know, a, a chance to, um, to, to work in industry that, um, you know, that means something to me. I, I've been a, a gamer all my life from the early days of playing the, you know, the Atari 2600 and, and having a VIC 20, um, and uh, and typing programs in from from Run Magazine. There used to be this magazine called Run Magazine, yeah. and people would um, sort of put in code for little programs that you could type in and run. And my brother and I would type in like tiny little games that we could play on my on my crappy little Vic Twenty. <laughs> um, but you know, it was just it was something I loved and used to lose myself in. And so to be able to work in an industry you care about, to be able to work at a company that you know isn't a, thought of as a big giant mega corporation. Mm-hmm. You know, the people that I that I work with, um, that I have the privilege to work with and, and alongside every day are, are my friends. They're, they're, they are um, essentially my second family. It's it's all I've ever known in this industry. And, and the games that we make are stuff that I genuinely love to be a part of and love to to help make a success. And, you know, those opportunities don't come along uh, an awful lot in in life. And so the chance to keep keep doing that and, and every time try and do it better is you know, it, it's still um, it's still fun and exciting for me. And I think if ever a day comes that that it's not, then then maybe I, I'll go do something else. But but for now, they haven't gotten rid of me. And, <laughs> and <laughs> that's, the, that's and the most impressive here. thing. Yeah. yeah nothing's, and I this is the question I let off with yesterday was what happened to Bethesda? And it's still I still especially the, all the context you just gave is still my question. What happened with Bethesda and the fact that you go from being this small group to being this huge group, you still have your tight knit, these are my friends, these are my family feel to it. But I keep going back to when I think about Bethesda, because you know, it, it, you're this interesting beast in terms of a uh, publisher slash developer in the way that, you know, I'm celebrating a decade in the industry this mm-hmm. year. And this is in my, oh. uh, my, my, my decades. Thank you very much. Actually, today is my decade Get of out of here. Jeremy Dunham sending my, my, the email saying, hey, do you want to, you're still interested in this job? I'd like to interview you. That's awesome. Thank you very much. And when I got there, you know, 2007, I get there right as Fallout 3 starts to become this giant thing. Because it's like we get there and there's still Elder Scrolls. Right. Yep. I, and, and stick with me. I'm, I'm playing loose, fast yeah, yeah. and loose. But I mean, like my second E3 is the Fallout 3 E3 yep. where we talked about yesterday where yep. Colin Moriarty walks in and you guys think he's punking you. Yeah. Right? Like, you know what I mean? Because you're just about to play a demo where you meet Colin Moriarty in, in Fallout 3. Yeah. And so even then I remember being like, oh, cool. Fallout, I've kind of heard about it. It's not my, you know, I wasn't a PC guy. I don't know anything about that really. But then Fallout 3 obviously becomes this thing. And even Elder Scrolls, I had known about it, but high fantasy was never my thing. Right. Even then you guys were, I don't want to say like, you were you were clearly players in the video game sk- space. You were, th- but I mean like now you're Bethesda. Now you are this thing where you, mm-hmm. like I was talking about, you know, your 2015 press conference at E3, right. where I really felt that was not, that was a statement from you guys of like, hey, everybody, we've, whatever you thought of us before, we've quietly been aligning studios, partnerships, games, franchises, mm-hmm. and now we're ready to come out and say, we are a Ubisoft. We are an EA. We are one of these people you need to think about as a brand rather than a collection of random titles. Mm-hmm. Where does that come from? Where does that start? Um, well, first of all, it's funny when you talk about like 2007 and coming off of, um, 
Oblivion and going into Fallout 3, and I'm sitting here trying to think, and, and I can't answer it, and it would take me a while to, because you're like, well, is Bethesda wasn't necessarily somebody that was on your radar, and I'm trying to think, like, well, outside of Oblivion and Fallout 3, like, why why would you have heard of us? Like, what was the thing that we had shipped? Yeah. I'm sure we shipped stuff in between there. Like, I'm positive it did, sure. but I, nothing jumps to mind. Like, it's it's just not... It's not a we were we were doing titles uh, like a Sea Dogs or Echelon or uh, I mean shit I I used to go to we were doing IHRA drag racing games for a while and I was up in I went to Indiana once and Michigan once to do some some different drag race events um, and uh, you know because we we were making a lot of money off of making drag sure. racing games yeah, yeah. go really fast straight for a quarter of a mile <laughs> um, <laughs> we can render really well for yeah. this quarter of a mile. Um, mm. And uh, how you get there is by, first of all, recognizing sort of who you are and what you're about, which is we're Bethesda. Um, we, we're, not, we're not ever going to try and build to do 10, 20, 50 uh, games a year. We don't make, um, we're, we're not focused on the casual market. We're not focused on any number of other things that have kind of come and gone and, and, uh, and come into vogue or so forth. We, we focus on a, a few small things. We make the kind of stuff that we like to play that is unique or has a different take or an interesting approach to something, whether it's a shooter or an RPG or whatever. Um, and, and that's what we're going to do and focus on. And how you get to where we were in 15 is by starting in 2008, 2007, and even before then, by continuing to look for people that had similar philosophies and goals in terms of like, I want to make something, but I don't want it to just be formulaic or to do something that mm -hmm. somebody else has done. Uh, and you start to, you know, follow and talk with people like Ralph Colantonio at Arcane. You start having conversations with the, the id guys or, um, you know, keeping in touch with the, with the guys that, that, uh, that became machine games sure. um, that had done really cool stuff um, at, at other publishers, at other developers, and finding people who shared that common belief in terms of what am I trying to do with this game? Am I, I you know, I want to do something special. I have a, a special take of doing something different and building that capacity. You know, it was never our intention to say we need to buy X number of studios in the next few years. It was let's just find cool people to work with. In the case of Arcane, we finally sort of got on their radar where they didn't have a project they were moving on to next. And we started working with them on what became the original Dishonored. But we worked with them for a while before we ever had the conversation about, hey, like maybe it makes sense for you to be you internal. Like, yeah, is that something yeah. you guys would be interested in? Yeah, sure. Um, and it, it just worked out that way. Um, same thing with with it. Like that conversation started. Like we love what you guys do, and you know we'd like to talk to you about. You know, can we work together? There's a possibility of something we could do, and and that conversation evolved in a similar way. So internally, as you're, this is happening, is I, I feel like, and maybe it's just the jaded guy inside of me in the video game industry and how corporations work and all this. Mm -hmm. Is there a company meeting where you're talking about our goals are to become this thing and do this thing? Or is it so natural that one day you're in a meeting and you look back and you're like, well, we are working with it and we have our candy. We have, woo, like, it, it, is it just we want to get a menagerie of awesome people together? Or was it you wanted to hit these different beats and go out and move this it, way? It was, it was honestly more about like, what do we want to be working on next? And who do we want to be working on it with and trying to constantly reevaluate and examine like what are our options what are our possibilities because you talk to a lot of people all the time but sometimes you find the right studio you want to work with and a cool idea or a notion of what you might want to do but look a lot of these folks are are indie developers and the way that they work or are structured like they don't just have the flexibility to say like we finished that thing we're going to take a little while to kind of think about what we want to do next like they got bills to pay and <laughs> you know some of them are literally um, living hand to mouth even the really successful ones because th that's just how indie development sure. worked and so you're trying to find the right opportunities and the right times to bring people on board to do things that you think are cool or uh, interesting or different and figure out like, okay, well, how long is that going to take? Because what you don't want is, all right, well, we accidentally released six titles in 2010 and then we got nothing in 11 and nothing in 12 because everybody was lined up for one year. Like that's not good either. Yeah. So it, it's about timing and figuring out how to pace it out and find the right fits. And we did hit a strike there. We went id and then I don't remember what the order of the dominoes was, but Arcane, Machine Games, and Tango kind of came yeah. in close succession. But all of those were sort of 
individual unique situations based on conversations and, and what was going on. It wasn't like uh, somebody went to Todd Vaughn, our VP of development, and was like, look, go find us three studios to buy You know, this year. Go. Yeah. It was just... Who are we going to work with? He's like, well, Shinji is, you know, looking to do survival horror. He's got this studio. We should talk to them. And these guys at Starbreeze all left. And there's a core of them that, had, you know, started machine games. And they are really interested in doing Wolf. Like each of those things kind of on their own sounded like good opportunities and sort of got us to where we were in 2015 and, and where we are today. And I mean, well, that's the thing, you know, you know, I talked about it yesterday, but I think it was my own not naivety, but I mean, I was wrong in the way when I remember watching the 2015 press conference and it, we did it. It was awesome. We're like, oh, and fall, fall looks great. But they'd also other stuff. And it's like, this was awesome. They won't do it again next year because this is clearly what they were. They they had this roster ready to go of these amazing games. And that, that's and that's all well and good. They're not a player like that. Right. And then next year, you guys, no, no, here's your invitation to the 2016. You shove it. And like, oh, <laughs> damn. All right. And then and I think it really was that thing. You did that. And then you put out an I mean, 2016, a banner year for you guys yeah you know i mean doom and then i mean doom coming out and then being lauded is just like oh my god what a revival it's it feels so different it's so beautiful it's mm -hmm. so smooth and then dishonor 2 coming out and being that game that wins game of the year and we talked about this yesterday we'll get to it again being this hardcore fan base around it where mm -hmm. you either get it and you love it or you don't and who cares so you know what i mean like right. you, it, I, the you guys are moving in a different clip now i think and it's interesting i i i knowing you and having followed you and Having yesterday's conversation, not today's conversation, I don't. I guess it wasn't a change in philosophy. It's just no. the way it, it became. No, it really wasn't. It was just, um, you know, I, I've said before. People ask me like, well, "What do you want? To, what do you want the next year to look like for Bethesda?" Or like, "What do you want to be doing personally in five years?" And my answer is always, "I, I just want to do a better version of the thing that we already did." Like, there's going to be a new game coming along, and like, how do we take all the stuff that we learned from the last game that we made, whether it's um, how we talk about it or when we talk about it, or how we interact with the developer and go through the process. We talked about this yesterday about like the challenge of just working with somebody you've never shipped a game with and figuring out how to work together to make sure you're each kind of getting what you need out of the partnership and shipping something and then saying like, okay, we learned a lot. Like, let's do that again, only better. Like there's yeah. no, there's no end to that path. Nobody has got it um, perfect because every game has its own has its own challenges. And so just that w where we are now is just a continued progression. What do I want 2017 to look like? I want to execute even better on the stuff that we have to execute on. Uh, you know, we've got Prey, uh, we got uh, Elder Scrolls Online Morrowind that we just announced. We got a few other things going on that we that we haven't uh, announced. We've got Quake Champions working. We got Elder Scrolls Legends, you know, going to be coming out of beta and coming out to a bunch of other platforms. Like, I just want to do each of those uh, the justice they deserve from from my team's standpoint of talking about them and getting the word out there and hopefully reaching an audience that says that's pretty cool I like what that's doing like I want to try it I want to play it or yeah. you should try it and play it or or whatever did you know when you started in on all this that every game was going to be different like that like did you or was that a harsh reality to wake up to the fact of like oh well you know we did these game we did this game that way so I can apply that oh no I can't okay well I learned no I can't do that in this one every project uh, for me it was a pretty easy lesson to learn early on because so much of the stuff that I was working on was this like I mean I think we may have talked about this before but like my first press tour was just this dog's breakfast of video games like uh, we had just shipped PBA Bowling right before I started at Bethesda Who in can 1999. Forget? Who can forget? Uh, we were working on IHRA Drag Racing, Skip Barber Racing. Uh, Skip Barber is a racing school, like uh, performance cars. Gotcha. Um, my brother's actually been through the Skip Barber Racing School. Was he uh, in the game? Uh, he was not, <laughs> which never shipped. So <laughs> oh, nobody well, was go. technically no, in that <laughs> game. Um, we were working on uh, Sea Dogs, which was a, a, a like a naval-based RPG based out of uh, Russia. We were working on Echelon, which was like a fighter, futuristic fighter thing. Like It was just all over the place, and there really wasn't anything like, oh, we could just kind of formulate, like, what are you going to take from IHRA Drag Racing mm. that applies at all to sea dogs like it was just this we were kind of all, all all over the place in the kinds of stuff we were trying and doing um so no i i, I kind of knew early on like yeah this is going to be like starting all over from scratch every single time every single game just because ultimately that's mostly what it felt like you shift from a naval based rpg to i trade drag racing too like not yeah, a lot you're, of milestones you're starting and all ideas. over again yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so you know, we talked about all these games you're putting out that I think are, you know, extraordinary. You know what I mean? Whether it be Fallout, whether it be Dishonored, whether it be Elder Scrolls and stuff like that. 
I, you have this reputation right now for putting out these amazing games. Mm-hmm. Everybody loves Bethesda. You guys fire on all cylinders. And, but I think that becomes you you call the herd. You you guys have been known to you know get away and pray to pray to, right? We're mm-hmm. not gonna do this game anymore. We're gonna get away. For you, when how at what point in development do you know, oh my god, we're on to something crazy good like Doom? Mm-hmm. Or do you know like, okay, something's really wrong and we have to start thinking about cutting prey to? Um And those are just examples. Sure. Obviously. Um it's it's different for every game. Um Obviously, there's milestones all along the way that are kind of check-ins in terms of like, are we developing all the art assets we need and getting, um, you know, the milestones checked off in terms of like where we need our AI to be or our graphics rendering or whatever. But there are there are larger checkpoints along the way where you expect to get your first hands on or something that's a chunk that's a representative four to five hours of the game that's really kind of showing you it may not all be pretty and beautiful but sure. it's a it's a representative slice of like this is what the game is going to be like um those those come in different points for different games um and sometimes you reach a point and you actually haven't checked all the boxes but you know really for certain or just yeah it, sometimes it's a feeling like okay we've got a few issues but these issues are really solvable okay and easy like uh, I remember for a long time, Wolfenstein: The New Order was, uh, in my opinion, and and a number of folks in my group and throughout the company was way too hard. You just died mm. all the time, way too easy. Which at a certain point, in a, you you could raise a flag and be like, "This is going to be a real problem." But you know, talking to again to Todd Vaughn, our VP of development, he has a he has a wonderful sense for like. Um, what are the what are the solutions to the problem? And he's like, yeah, in this case, like the actual problem you're feeling is we're not dropping enough ammo. That's why you keep dying because you keep running out of ammo for all these different weapons, and you end up like just shooting this one crappy one that you're not very good at, and it doesn't do much. Da- like we just need to drop more ammo; it'll be fine. Yeah. Like, okay. Like that. That's something that's a you solvable don't, right. problem. Another one of like playing a game in two hours and like this isn't fun. Yeah. Like, what do you mean it's not fun? Like, wh- what do you mean? What do I mean? I'm not having any fun. I just spent two hours on something and at no point was it fun. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was supposed to do next. Like, that's a, like, well, how do we solve that? But like, that's a much tougher uh, question to answer. And so, you know, to your to your question, there certainly with projects, uh, you know, Doom Four, we yeah. we. We called it at a certain point and said, it it looks beautiful. It runs great. It is actually fun. It's just not Doom. And, and we need, if this is going to succeed, we're going to reboot this thing and kind of bring it back into, you know, this this modern era. It's got to be an authentic Doom game and not something that's got the Doom name but feels more like Battlefield or Call of Duty or whatever. Um, and we made that call and at a point where you could get a good idea of what the game was and, and appreciate like there's nothing we're going to do to this what, based on what we have that's going to get it there. We got to we got to stop and throw all retool. of this out and retool. And in the case of something else, you just reach a point where you hit those problems that like I, I don't see a path how we're going to get there. You might have a schedule that says, well, this is how we get to the end of the game. But like checking off all of the things on the milestone list is not the goal of game development, right? The game, the goal of game development is when we're done, we have something really fun and interesting and unique that people are going to want to play and enjoy. And when they do play it, they're like, wow, this is really cool. Um, you should play it. You should try it. Dishonored 2, Doom, like yeah. those games um, hit that bar, reach that goal. Just finishing the game is not good enough. And and our belief has always been, you know, kind of going back to our core philosophy, that Ultimately, the game is the thing, and and it's a really hard decision to cancel a game or to start over or to delay a product. All of those things we take really seriously because, you know, we are running a company that pays salaries to people, and like the only way we do that is if we make money. So delaying stuff has real consequences, but you have to do what's in the best interest, which is long term. The thing that we make has to really resonate with the audience that it's intended for or like we're screwed. It doesn't matter how many ad dollars you spend. It doesn't matter how many people, you know, you get to stream the game. Like it's just going to die before you ever get started. And so you, um, you don't always enjoy making those decisions, but ultimately like if we're going to succeed and we're going to continue to, to go forward, you've got to be able to step back and say like, are we actually going to get to where we intend to, or has this all been for not? And sometimes, you know, you end up waving goodbye to millions and millions of dollars you spent over years to make a thing and just say, look, 
all we're looking at is millions more that we're going to put into something that we have no real path to success.